Welcome to another episode of our podcast at Access to Perspectives Conversations. My name is Joe Haveman, and I'm very happy to be welcoming today Jennifer Souza and Vino Ilangrovan, who both are working at the Open Research Knowledge Graph, which yeah, we're going to hear more about from you. But um, so one welcome to both of you, Jennifer and Vino. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. It's a delight to be here on your podcast. So um, starting with, uh, um, could you please tell us a little bit about yourselves, um, where you're coming from and um, what your research interests were before um, joining the Open Research Knowledge Graph? And then, of course, let's hear about what it actually is, what you're trying to accomplish or are already accomplishing very much, as we've seen. And to the listeners, you find the links to the websites um, being mentioned and the knowledge graph itself in the show notes um, or also known the affiliated blog post. So yeah, who wants to start? Maybe Jennifer. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, so uh, about my background and experience. Um, so I've been working in um, developing NLP systems for over a decade now. Um, that's what I started with during my PhD studies in the US. Um, and uh, I've ever since continued uh, mostly in an academic setting, um, but also briefly um, in industry. Um, so my work has a uh, remotely been connected to knowledge graph construction. So I've always been looking at systems to extract entities from unstructured text to extract relations between these entities. And as we know, these are uh, main constituent components of knowledge graphs. They're based on entities and relations between these entities. Mm -hmm. So I just pretty much brought my work experience over to the knowledge graph project where currently I'm investigating similar systems uh, to build a high quality um, knowledge graph of uh, research contributions in science for mm. the OKG. Um, yeah, that's that's about my background and transition to the Open Research Knowledge Graph project uh, at the ORKG. I work as a postdoctoral researcher in the team, um, and I'm often mentoring um, PhD students or master's thesis students because we often have uh, various open questions around building a high quality knowledge graph powered by NLP systems. As we know, machine learning systems often suffer from um, lack of precision, and this is um, this is not um, very good when it comes to uh, curating a high quality graph. So we want we don't we want to avoid misinforming our users as much as possible. So um, now my work lies in between uh, tying in high precision NLP systems to curate the knowledge graph um, with uh, our existing main strategy, that is to curate the knowledge graph based on crowdsourcing. So similar to say a Wikipedia um, uh, a model of mm -hmm. curating uh, a high quality graph. So I uh, uh, tend to develop systems that, that support this this process and can uh, facilitate it uh, better. And now listening to how you're explaining and we've had conversations before um, about the knowledge graph, but maybe if you could say a few words what the knowledge graph is, <laughs> so what's for the listeners who may be new to the topic. It's basically a visualization of complex data. And in this particular case, it's about mapping research projects. And Right. Uh, so indeed, as you said, uh, visualizing um, complex data uh, and then specifically, we would say um, structuring uh, unstructured text. So, uh, you know, having um, um, like um, so the basic constituents of knowledge graph would be uh, subject, predicate, object, triples. And uh, these kind of constitute um, an equivalent uh, representation of the unstructured text. Um, and uh, given that the knowledge graph is like um, 
um, a semantic representation of the data, it becomes much easier to query uh, for uh, specific entities of interest that are modeled uh, within the knowledge graph. Where an unstructured text, it is a much harder problem to query for a specific entity and discover uh, relevant relations that the, this that a particular entity shares with other entities. In a knowledge graph, it's directly modeled in the graph itself, and so you know one can issue maybe a Spark will query and and uh, get this fine grained uh, information from the knowledge graph. Mm, thank you so much, and uh, you know. How did you join the team? Yeah, so I'm trained as a biomedical scientist. Uh, so uh, within uh, biological sciences or life sciences, we deal quite a lot with ontologies, uh, which are quite important for creating knowledge graphs uh, or to um, you know link uh, the real world entities into the semantic web. So we use a lot of ontology. Uh, so while being trained as a biologist, I was also uh, involved in a lot of open science initiatives. Um, for example, the Max Planck Open Access Ambassador. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, that's where we met. Uh, so we were, uh, myself and Joe are alumni of the Max Planck uh, Society. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, I've been doing uh, some um, research culture reforms or like trying to reform research culture in, in general. Uh, so I, in, in, in my capacity as an early career researcher, as a, a PhD uh, candidate initially, and then as a postdoc. Um, so uh, this also builds up a lot of frustration where uh, you try to reform a system that is uh, not built uh, for most of us. It is built for specific uh, demographic of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is when I try to use um, um, opportunities where I can really leverage emerging technology to really solve the problem. Because the reason why we come into science is actually to solve certain problems. And if the if if the means to solve those problems become problematic, then we need to solve that first. So that's the approach that I took, like step back and then um, I'm okay not doing pipetting and uh, bench work in biology, but then um, can deal with ontology and uh, yeah, trying to create uh, knowledge graphs with the human in the loop. Uh, so as Jennifer mentioned, uh, Jennifer is looking into the um, NLP services or the named entity recognition services that could automate a knowledge graph. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, we're also working with different stakeholders who are you know, researchers, information scientists, uh, data curators, or researchers who could be data curators, uh, and also subject librarians. Um, and we use a crowd-based curation approach in the open research knowledge graph. Um, uh, but uh, it's not just only the crowd, but also we want to implement a machine automated curation process, which should bring us then high quality data. Uh, but then to achieve that, we need to also deal with human in the loop at the moment. And that is where uh, my role currently focuses on within the curation and the community building team. So I uh, work as a uh, curation coordinator for the open research knowledge graph. Mm. And I think like data curation also for journal publishing is of highest importance. And I feel we have a, not a lack, not, like it's not totally missing, but I think it's a bit underserved currently in the scholarly publishing um, ecosystem at large. Because it's it's like in my observation, it's been a lot about, and I think also um, as a common perception that it's been a lot about quantity in the past few decades. And now we have a lot of research output going out and how can we now curate that in a way that makes sense to make the most use of the data being produced. And that's also basically a key issue that uh, Knowledge Graph is trying to solve, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, one aspect is that uh, our scholarly publishing system or the scholarly knowledge dissemination system is focused on uh, document-centric uh, knowledge flow rather than knowledge-centric uh, knowledge flow. And that has created such a um, quantity problem um, versus quality problem. Uh, so I think uh, knowledge graphs are uh, a solution or we are on the side of the solution where we try to create uh, uh, synergies between uh, publishers and uh, conference organizers where we could actually get the content into the knowledge graph while it is being published rather than as a afterthought after it's being published. 
Um, so that's uh, something that we are trying to do with the open research knowledge graph. Yeah, and if I could add to that as well. Um, uh, so um, uh, what was like the initial question that we kind of are constantly asking ourselves with the ORKG project is, um, can a scholarly knowledge be modeled as another representation other than discourse-based communication? So um, now I think in this present age, we, um, you know, research is widespread and it's global. So we see like overwhelming number of publications released each year. So like using traditional search models like Google search, like if you search for a current problem on Google search, then you will get like over a million hits of uh, pub publications. And uh, then there are these cognitive tie-ups. Then the researcher has to like sift through all of these publications and scour through the knowledge in them. So with the ORKG, we basically want to use uh, these semantic models of publishing. So the knowledge graph representation of just the contribution of the article. So say we have uh, contributions of several articles modeled within the ORKG, uh, then uh, we can think of it somewhat similar to the Amazon product services paradigm. So the Amazon knowledge graph has uh, uh, fine grained information about just the products and its key features. Mm -hmm. So equivalently, the ORKG has information about just the contribution of an article based on its key properties. So then it becomes very easy for the researcher to compare several different contributions in just a glance in a table. And so we support such uh, features over the knowledge graph that we are constructing. So then the researcher doesn't have to like scour through a million or so articles to sort of fish out just the salient aspects. And, and of course, once they look at such overviews, uh, in the ORKG of just the contribution elements, then they can say, okay, this contribution looks interesting. The method that it has explored looks interesting. So maybe we can read the article further. So, uh, so that's kind of like the information access bottleneck problem that we are trying to uh, address with the ORKG. Mm, yeah, that sounds really useful. Uh, and um, so to what, extent because what you mentioned what's necessary or what's often missing and what you're providing with the knowledge graph is contextualized information in an overview like to have that comparable in a table like structure um and how is is does that depend because that's another issue i've come across also with um metadata assignment to research output um that it depends on what the researchers like how the researchers describe their their papers or their data sets and in how much detail and also by talking to other career researchers often what i find is that they like we humans we tend to live in our bubbles and we tend to often miss crucial information that's obvious to us but might not be as obvious to others to make an informed decision if this is relevant or not um yeah, maybe to to give an example like uh, like something that's really annoying and also historically um impactful in many negative ways is medical research where um research that's been published is has usually been done on white male corpses or or um subjects like <laughs> or patients and then being extrapolated to, to this is what, how humans function, like of all genders, of all um, ethnicities around the world, and it's just not true, like for many many medical conditions. So I feel like it's it's also what I tell, especially medical students, to to explicitly contextualize to um, what um, sample group they're looking at and where the research was conducted, and so the how, where, when is also crucial and often missing, like what time of year, was it winter or summer in the Northern hemisphere? Does that even apply to the global, like, global South as in geographical region um, where we don't have seasons like we know in Europe or the United States? 
Um, so to what extent do you, can the knowledge graph or, or how much metadata do you contribute or can this be automated to some extent based on information given in the articles and using artificial intelligence, whatever algorithms? Or is this um, to a large extent depending on still the authors to submit the data? And I think that's the best source to have but then how can we sensitize the authors of what information they should provide to make the knowledge graph useful? I mean, it's already useful. I'm not questioning it per se, but to make it even more useful and powerful. Do you want to go on that, Jennifer? Okay, sure. I could uh, start us out. Um, I think, Joe, you pointed out um, a very wide area of you know it's it's um it's a very broad open-ended um area of discussion um um and there are many uh, ideas that pop to my mind but maybe i could try to address some um so one of the things i guess is is a lack of transparency so um like we juxtapose uh the discourse-based scholarly communication so we have like nine pages of text and just expound this exponentially over like a million articles compared to the ORKG just representing the salient aspects of, of uh, the research, right? So it could be, uh, let's say, in the medical domain, as you said, um, uh, which was um, what was the uh, cohort that was used, uh, what was their demographic. Uh, this could be like the salient aspects of the contribution, say, in medical research. And that's uh, recorded explicitly in the knowledge graph. So when you uh, construct these comparative views uh, on these salient aspects uh, across articles who have addressed the same research problem, this lack of transparency problem, which exists with the discourse-based communication, you know, so we are like having to look like where, what was the cohort, what was like, and we can miss a lot of this poignant information that needs to drive research forward or that needs to be addressed in terms of limitations. So only certain cohort groups are used for a study. So we need to directly address this. And then with the ORKG, this lack of transparency problem is immediately alleviated because you're directly looking at the salient aspects and any new researcher coming into the field can look at these overviews and say, okay, so this cohort has been predominantly studied, we need to switch to another, another, um, another user group. Uh, so uh, that's one way of like tackling this problem by explicitly modeling it in the knowledge graph. Um, and then, um, yeah, and um, uh, so, right. And then uh, another thing is like, um, I don't know if this addresses what you raised, but maybe I could just add it as a discussion. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, right, another thing would be like, um, we often do uh, like related work comparisons for our research anyway. So as you said, uh, each of us are in our silos and we are doing these related work um, uh, comparisons and then we write it in the discourse text. Right, and so that's our piece of text. And then um, we publish that in an article. Um, then a, a new researcher comes in and is studying the same research problem. Unfortunately, because we work in these silos and it's not possible to interoperate, you know, interoperability over research, um, uh, discourse text between researchers is not possible. So then this research has to do that very same work that somebody else did like comparing related work and they write a different piece of uh, related work text. Now with the ORKG, this problem I would say is directly addressed because we make research contributions interoperable mm -hmm. um, or the graph or rather um, scholarly publishing itself becomes like an interoperable model. So let's say one researcher does like a related work comparison. So they create this, uh, they know, they identify all the salient properties that they are, um, they want to compare between multiple works. And so they create, you know, several structured uh, paper descriptions, and then they can publish it in the ORKG. So you get a persistent URL for that, uh, for that related work. Um, and 
what is even better is then we have various export formats so we can export that as LaTeX or whatever and so they can directly embed this piece of code in, in their uh, work. Um, so another researcher reading this paper can directly reuse that related work uh, comparison that they've created on the salient properties and maybe just add to it or complement it or maybe add other properties. So in this way, like uh, research analysis is becoming interoperable between different researchers. So it's not remaining like a, a work in silo anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, at least with the semantic uh, publishing model that's trying to alleviate this problem. Mm, yeah, sounds reasonable. You know, do you want to add? Uh, yeah, uh, I think Jennifer covered most of it. I just wanted to add that uh, when we uh, think of a knowledge centric flow and then in, you know, through the semantic uh, technology supporting it, um, I think it did provide us uh, new ways of discovering trends and, um, you know, um, uh, new ways of discovering what problems we need to address first. And uh, also it becomes evident uh, which of the things are missing in the transparent uh, in the transparency of uh, uh, research study. Uh, if we compare, try and compare the salient features that are already available. Um, and uh, if, to answer your question, whether that is author provided or is it also automated? I think uh, there are several places where authors provide that within the document, but mm -hmm. because it's a document-centric over, overview of knowledge, uh, we tend to miss those important pieces because we mm -hmm. tend to overlook it or we just miss it because it's in, in a dense, densely packed text. And I think um, pulling that out into the semantic, um, uh, semantically supported structures would uh, enable us to see uh, what things are important and uh, we wouldn't overlook those. And if something is overlooked by a uh, few of the authors, then they could also bring that up and then create uh, extended templates and extended um, extend those uh, comparisons of salient features of different articles. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I like, okay, so looking at how many or like an increasing number of researchers using the Open Research Knowledge Graph or RKG. Um, <laughs> like acronyms are never easy for me to either remember or, yeah. But, um, so is this then also scalable in the sense of, or, or what if, like, hmm. so I'm saying other limitations in terms of numbers, like, or should it be the individual researchers or a cohort of meta researchers mostly, like who's the target audience for the knowledge graph or both? Because I'm thinking like there's certainly like researchers who just want to do their research as they know how to do best and not have to um, go too much into the analysis beyond the actual analysis of what have we studied here and how I'm going to present those to others. Um, and then there's those who want to do both and connect it to other existing research meaningfully, meaning nowadays digitally semantically. Um, and then there's probably like uh, also a whole league of meta researchers who are like who are best suited to use tools like the knowledge graph to make sense of the research output that we're not dealing with. Um, did I capture that right? Like, would it does the concept as it is now address these uh, different use cases and what have I missed? Um. If I may go on that, Jennifer. Uh, so uh, we are um, collaborating with researchers and trying to identify more use cases. Um, although I would want to mention that at the moment, an individual researcher can use the ORKG to describe their structured article, or they could also uh, describe uh, multiple of multiple articles in their field in a structured way. So that is possible. And uh, researchers who do meta research or researchers who want to do a systematic uh, literature review. Um, so we also enable them to uh, use or that is one of the most use cases we uh, thought about. And that is possible with the ORKG right now. And uh, we also have um, uh, groups of researchers who would want to uh, get the data uh, or metadata from published literature into the ORKG uh, for example, in the case of disease like muscular dystrophy and so on. So there are these groups uh, who work 
closely in collaboration with the uh, curation and the development team uh, to uh, see how their data can be represented. Uh, so we work in close collaboration with different groups of researchers. So uh, this, uh, the, we are increasing the possibility uh, beyond just single researcher versus a systematic review or systematic literature review mm -hmm. uh, by a meta researcher uh, to uh, groups of researchers who would use uh, ORKG um, or the Open Research Knowledge Graph uh, to create a knowledge graph for their own particular field and identify uh, trends and um, you know identify what are the uh, important aspects that they need to cover from the existing data that's already published. Uh, so that is something that uh, we are working on. Mm. And just so to appreciate also the work going into because I remember this is not too long ago, I was still today, like when I give trainings on scientific um, reading, writing, publishing, and then tell the early career researchers um, of, you know, like even if you publish in nature, the, the likelihood that your research is being cited and reused is quite low, unfortunately. <laughs> but, like, and people who might actually be interested have a hard time finding your work. Also, like I haven't actually done the exercise, but I've been recently thinking like an exercise, like try and find your own published article, no matter where it's published. It has a DOI assigned through Crossref. It is therefore discoverable in all the indexing databases. Try and find it based on the tags, um, keywords that you assigned yourself in this mass of research outputs. And yeah, it would be interesting to measure the time it takes for, for the students or the researchers to find their own work because it's one thing to make it discoverable, but then again, like we need tools like the knowledge graph, open research knowledge graph to be precise. And there's a few other tools that are addressing the same issue with, with similar and yet differing approaches. So it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's comforting to know that we're on it. <laughs> Jennifer, do you want to add? Uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's very interesting. Um, and uh, now semantic models, of course, for representing information uh, or semantic modeling uh, of information is, is definitely not new, like we didn't invent it. Mm. And it's like in other domains, for example, like encyclopedic knowledge and um, uh, again, e-commerce uh, or maps, uh, they're all pervasive. People have been using them for years and years now. And we've seen how our lives are like, um, uh, I don't know, uh, the quality of our lives are enhanced. Like, for example, we go visit a new town. And so we use Google Maps and we are like, all right, what are the main attractions nearby? And that information is so quickly discoverable. Like it's stored within this interconnected network of entities and relations. And we so quickly find exactly what we are looking for most of the times <laughs> as opposed to like in the old days where we would use like map booklets and have to like search oh my gosh this location's here now how do I get to this point and stuff stuff like that so we see how like digitalization or semantic modeling in other areas have like greatly enhanced like uh, the quality of human life and uh, the application of information technologies. Um, so with the ORKG, basically, we are just advocating to use the similar model, but for scholarly publication, publishing uh, as well. And as you said, Joe, like, uh, you know, even looking for one's own articles is, is really a, a hard task, like finding a needle in a haystack these days, given like the whole volume of scientific publishing and so if we can model um, like an entity relation graph on scholarly contributions uh, then um, given these comparisons that it facilitates and the machine actionability of the knowledge like can help us like tap into um, uh, better information access technologies um, and another thing is um, of course, like um, there is a paradigm that needs to be changed. So now we've gotten used to in like four decades of, you know, um, the research uh, trajectory as a, as a uh, timeline, um, as publishing our work is in discourse form. So we write long sentences and so on. So uh, basically with the ORKG, we aren't saying you need to write 
different kinds of information, you're doing the same thing, but you're just using a different model to represent that information. And mm -hmm. so that's a little bit of the paradigm that we are advocating to change. So researchers, we'd have no problems writing our articles because that's what we've gotten used to. Uh, so it's just now we need to uh, tap into uh, the, the, I guess, the benefits that knowledge graphs can offer, even in the scholarly publishing paradigm, uh, scholarly publishing domain, and kind of change that paradigm of recording our knowledge. So instead of writing like long texts of related work, we could just create this uh, succinct or KG comparison and export it as LaTeX and publish it in our papers. And that's kind of like a living section of the article because it has a persistent URL in the ORKG and somebody else can come and add to it and add that same uh, comparison to their paper. And this can be shared like across the globe, right? So it's on the web and so on. Mm. So that's that paradigm change that we are kind of going for and trying to uh, bring into the research community. Yeah, I think the idea of turning research outcomes into living documents is also the approach that preprint publishing is now taking. Also, like, I'm not a fan of the word preprint because I don't think there's anything pre about preprints. <laughs> but we're having these discussions in different um, groups and, and consortia. Um, so I would like to uh, maybe come to the question of language as in um so i think i asked you this before you know so the knowledge graph is conceptualized in english and for english articles primarily or starting with are there any plans to turn into multilingual tool as well um at the moment the modeling happens to english and because we use ontologies quite a lot and sure. uh, ontologies are in english um and uh there are a lot of um, efforts into making scholarly communication multilingual. And um, because it is a semantic supported technology, we can actually link those ontologies to mm -hmm. an equivalent ontology in a different language. And it is only a matter of time when uh, ontologies are uh, developed in other languages that have equivalent classes, and then we can easily link them. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is my technical answer for that. Oh, that's um, but uh, yes, it, it is possible. It's just uh, it's just going to take a while uh, for the researchers uh, to come together to develop ontology in different languages. And mm -hmm. I think that is the only uh, bottleneck at the moment. Otherwise, uh, with the te technology readiness, and to um, implement things that the researchers' needs are. Um, mm. The ORKG is uh, very, very technology ready to uh, have multiple users and also to uh, support multiple use cases. Yeah, that's great to hear because um, we're, with Africa Archive, um, we're also involved in a project to translate English articles into lay summaries for in English and then into traditional African languages building glossaries of scientific terms in these languages which never existed before um and that can then as you say basically the glossaries could be then matched against the glossary of english terms in the knowledge graph that's perfect so and i also totally acknowledge and understand that building a tool in one language is already um quite a complex endeavor. <laughs> so you don't want to deal with the extra complexity of multilingualism as you build it, but make sure, but having that in mind and providing access points for multilingualism to come into play, that's already a great um, asset to have from the design process. Yeah, um, I, and, I, I've only covered the human in the loop model. So I think uh, Jennifer might have more perspectives from the, um, you know, um, machine language or artificial intelligence perspective. Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I agree with what Benoit said and what you added to Joe. Uh, I guess um, it becomes, um, mm -hmm. I guess the workflow that we would then see is then mapping back these glossaries of terms and other languages to our uh, knowledge graph, which is primarily in English. Although some users had tried adding some German articles to, to the knowledge graph. So like Winod said, the semantic modeling is fairly flexible mm -hmm. uh, uh, and is based on the wisdom of the crowd approach. So while we are mainly focusing on building a knowledge graph for um, English uh, published articles, 
it has enough support systems to incorporate other languages. And then uh, I guess then the um, uh, the uh, the model or rather um, the tooling would need to turn toward uh, machine translation systems and um, that would be its own uh, uh, own um, I guess a uh, problem to tackle because um, uh, often scientific uh, articles have these jargons and um, that kind of shifts away this domain of, of knowledge, uh, you know, from transparent uh, machine translation tools built for like uh, common sense English or common sense other languages from the common sense domain to the scientific domain. So mm -hmm. then we would have to see how how uh, uh, machine translation tools can, can transfer in such settings where uh, in the scientific domain we have specific jargons of knowledge, which is not common in the com common sense domain. So that's another paradigm that would then need testing if we consider uh, creating a, a multilingual multi mm -hmm. uh, graph. So then my hunch is that we can't directly use existing machine translation tools and would need to sort of train some parameters there to make it uh, domain adaptable in a way. Mm -hmm. And then, um... Since we're currently focusing on English in the design of the knowledge graph, but also in many of the disciplines for scientific publishing, where we're dealing with a mass of outcomes, um, how can the knowledge graph deal with, or is that also a skill or an asset of the knowledge graph to simplify or to to con to to make the information so concise so that variations of English don't matter? as much as because okay i'm going um, where i'm going with this is that there is not one english that is working in the world also there well we know of um you know, american english british english to start with there's canadian english australian english uh south african english and basically any country that has english as a first or economic language doesn't have to be the first national um, language like many of the colonial like previously colonial mm. states um including india and uh pakistan and others so and then when authors write articles so the the peer review barrier is one thing or the, the editorial barrier is one thing if the articles even get published or not but then there is differences in the semantics of the english and also, um, like as a trainer in scientific writing, apparently there is a, a, a paradigm that scientific English has to sound very technical and to be taken seriously. And I don't think that's a good approach also for us humans to communicate in and to make the research output comprehensible. Now there is um, like some publishers adopted a route of lay summaries to add to the abstract. But even researchers in the same discipline sometimes don't understand research articles because of the jargon and the highly technical English that's being used. And mm. I think it's also not a good attitude to start with. Um, anyways, but that's just uh, an opinion and certainly a dis discussion for another um, mm. time, another day. Okay, but here the question for the knowledge graph is, is the information in the knowledge graph simplified enough to bridge across all these different uh, variations of English to keep it short? Or is that a challenge that, that you also need to deal with in the, in the setup? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh... Do you want to go on that, Jennifer? Or... Okay, sure. I could. Uh, I could start at that. Um, so that's a good point. Um, that comes to again. It goes back to writing our articles using discourse. Uh, so we use rhetorics and so on, and in different styles of English that can vary. Uh, fortunately, in the knowledge graph, we don't see such variations. We don't find discourse variations. So basically, we just need a salient property uh, and a predicate, a relation, and then the object. So that kind of takes away all of these um, uh, variations in discourse, as, as I would say, discourse styles. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a uniformity there. Um, 
But we do see this problem, which is again common in the ontological world when you're modeling concept clusters, is that there's different uh, terms that you can use to refer to the same thing. So this ambiguity and so on. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we are actually trying to uh, develop neural network models that can detect these uh, similar terms, as we could call them, so similar concept clusters. Uh, so we did some experiments probing uh, large language models and seeing in which layer of the neural networks can we find such synonymy relations the best. Uh, so. Um, yeah, so at the moment we are looking at uh, different kinds of models and it's interesting um, that for uh, variations of the knowledge graph, so um, for example, the ORKG knowledge graph uh, spans science at large. And so we are looking at a much diverse concept uh, space. On the other hand, we look at another knowledge graph that's just focused on com computer science. So there the synonymy phenomenon is just seen for the computer science terms. So these large language models, we notice that they can identify synonymy uh, easily when it's domain centric in the lower layers of the, of the uh, network. So it's, um, uh, it's often seen that the lower layers of the network address the simpler pl problems and then the higher levels of the network encode more complex semantic spaces. And so we saw that for the ORKG, since it's synonymy phenomenon span science at large, it's captured in the higher levels of the model. So that becomes a little bit more complex for the models to capture this uh, diversity in, in terminology. Mm. So in terms of linguistic style itself, we don't face uh, uh, such a problem with the knowledge graph because it sort mm. of puts everyone on the same playing field. But in terms of how we call different things, uh, that's something that we do indeed observe with uh, with mm. um, the scientific space in general. Yeah, and that differs across, like sometimes even within a research field in the same institute, different research groups. Mm. And then I know that chaos tackled um, the issue of having one scientific term, but with different descriptions, what the term means, especially also again in medical research that happens all the time apparently, where there's a discussion and um, battle, like verbal battles or written battles or like, oh, it's it looks as if it's this and then the other research group without realizing that they're talking about the same thing, but looking at different thing, um, things at the thing. So, um, yeah, but that's that's more of a cultural, scientific culture issue that, I don't know, can this be solved also by the knowledge graph or maybe aided by a better um, purpose of uh, definitions for scientific terms again and variations of thereof. Also like for open science, there's not one definition what open science means for whom, um, in what context. Mm -hmm. so it's always context specific. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe that's not too much of an issue for what you're trying to solve here, is it? Yeah, I guess um, resolving ambiguity is indeed a problem that we we face. Mm. And oftentimes we are seeing researchers like uh, create resources that essentially mean the same thing, but that's a repeat. So we have so many like redundant resources in the ORKG. So this is why we are trying to use these embedding models to define these uh, synonymy, like uh, uh, group them together. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, as you said, um, context can can indeed help the process. So uh, these models, uh, these neural models with context can perform much better than trying to just uh, see a similar term and say, oh, that's similar to another term, but in which context? Mm -hmm. So um, it could be more error prone without context and just based on terminology where uh, this ambiguity that one term can have different uh, semantics in different contexts is not addressed by just a term based neural model, but a context supported neural model can actually address that. The only problem is like getting the data. So who's going to write the descriptions for these resources and things like that. So that's that's indeed a bottleneck here. 
uh, but it's not impossible to solve, of course. We just need to try to systematically address the problem right. and pin down some sources of information. Perhaps that could be useful. It's like in a research article when a project is concluded and then in the discussion part, like we've solved this and there's a few other things that still need to be addressed either by us or, us or whoever else has the budget and the interest to dig in. <laughs> Yeah, um, there was another thought I had when at, um, on this topic, semantics, um, definitions. We know, did you want to add to this? Maybe it will pop up again. Mm -hmm. So I, I think as Jennifer mentioned, uh, it is a problem that is solvable, mm -hmm. uh, but I think um, it is also, the, the context dependency comes from the discourse-based model. And I think and now we are trying to rethink scholarly communication in a way where scholarly work can be realized as uh, expressions other than just an article where you have a discourse form there you are just mentioning the salient features of that article. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it could also be captured at different stages. Like currently we are only focusing on the published um, article or the published literature uh, and the reason is because we need a persistent uh, identifier to link that uh, knowledge uh, knowledge centric overview of something to something that is existing and uh, in, in a disruptive imagination way I think uh, in, in a utopia that I imagine I think that could change and that could be captured at the time while people are writing an article or at, at the conceptualization stage where uh, authors write it and then uh, there is a um, a low weight semantic um, uh, plugin that would actually capture all of these and then bring it to ORKG and then wait until the persistent identifier is uh, defined for that. Uh, so that is something also work in progress, but I think that is also uh, to think about disruptive imaginative way uh, to think that that would happen. Um, it, it's, uh, it's not just science fiction is what I wanted to say. Uh, it is possible. Yeah. Um... Sorry, my, the dog that's sitting here with me is becoming a bit noisy. But I wanted to add because I, I just remembered what I wanted to, to bring into the discussion before we come to an end. Um, the question of why. What's the reason for the study in the first place? Um, and I feel like as much that's also often in the project proposal, why are we doing this work and um, what we're trying to solve it, it sometimes also gets lost in the process. And then the dynamic and the research questions change over time as the project mm -hmm. progresses. So maybe sometimes towards the end, the why gets lost or diffused. Um, so, and as, as you were adding now, you know, I like I think it's also a good opportunity with living documents like are now being developed and provided um, to for other researchers to add a why to a study that previously had a different one or non-explicit one because basic researchers might argue we don't have a why we're doing the research because we can and because this needs to be investigated so that's a why <laughs> but with no particular purpose for societal improvements or environmental protection or solving climate change like we have a lot of urgent issues to deal with where research can inform us better if we only make sense of the information that we already have. <laughs> um, but I think that's another level of dynamic and um, that, yeah, that like for other researchers to, to add information to a previous and related research has been done in the past and then continue building up on in a meaningful way. And that's how we can all win in the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you want to go. Oh, that's, true. <laughs> uh, that, that's a good point. Uh, also to wrap it up uh, of the whys, uh, I think uh, we need to also think about if uh, the knowledge is uh, mission actionable and human actionable um, because humans could read it, make sense out of it, but can we actually use that information to build upon this, you know, like the Lego blocks of science that can we take this and then build upon something. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, a knowledge graph or the ORKG actually assists that uh, by providing a structured uh, description of the article uh, so that there is like a building block uh, that one can build upon mm -hmm. uh, and extend uh, in, in certain niche fields. And as we already mentioned, um, 
looking for specific information is like finding needle in the haystack. And I think um, semantic technologies can support that. And this is like one attempt to uh, really try and solve that problem of finding specific questions um, mm -hmm. using uh, graph assisted technology. All right. Great. So um, final remarks. Is there one thing we didn't touch upon, like um, basically, or what's your favorite feature of the knowledge graph other than what we already discussed or also from the things we mentioned? Uh, Vino? Um, well, for me, it's actually the tools that Jennifer is developing <laughs> because it captures uh, things from the abstract in a in a way. And then it's, it's also, um, it's a human. It's still human in the loop, but then it's uh, more powerful than a human could do, and uh, it uh, identifies entities, and then we can decide if those entities belong to the right categories and um, deal with that. So mm -hmm. I would say that uh, named entity recognition service uh, is something that I really like in the ORKG. I might be biased, but uh, that's <laughs> something that I look forward for. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Vinod. <laughs> That's encouraging. <laughs> um, Pressure's uh, on. <laughs> uh, last remarks. I would just say um, favorite feature. Um, I I really enjoy like love the idea of having like living models of scholarly publishing. So we have living models of related work comparisons, and as you said, Joe, that you know. Um, I guess this goes towards the objective that we win together as scientists. Mm -hmm. So our work is interoperable, accessible, reusable, findable more easily. So uh, my favorite feature would essentially boil down to having structured contributions, uh, the basic element that uh, constitutes the ORKG upon which we could automatically construct surveys, reviews, so on. Uh, so yeah, that would, that would be my... Uh, favorite feature. <laughs> and now for researchers listening to us, or has been, or is still, um, how can they best get started in adopting the knowledge graph into their research? Is it just to sign up and then play, upload the data and play around? Uh, indeed. So I could uh, address it and then the note perhaps you might want to add. Um, so it's um, it's pretty straightforward. You would to add content in the ORKG, you can just sign up, create a user account. Uh, we have various modes of adding content to the ORKG that could be paper based mode or a contribution uh, comparison mode. Um, also, if you have your data in a CSV uh, file, we also support the import CSV function. So you can upload your CSV data into the ORKG. Uh, perhaps you made a related work comparison in a CSV file. So it's very easy to upload that and then get an ORKG comparison as a result. Uh, so indeed, we support uh, various modes of interaction and it's as easy as creating a user account in a matter of a few seconds and getting started. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Easy to do, you know? Something <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, one can create a user account with the ORKG because the ORKG is radically open. Uh, we support uh, FAR data. Um, and um, yeah, once they create comparisons, uh, then uh, their work could also be visibilized by actually making that um, you know, uh, one can uh, get a DOI for the work, which is citable then. Um, so that means uh, the work that they do on comparing different uh, articles uh, or the knowledge that emerges out of comparing those, which is not just in one article, but then by comparing all those uh, can be more uh, visibilized. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, uh, users can um, mm -hmm. user can just go inside the ORKG mm -hmm. by signing it up and then uh, add mm -hmm. content and create comparisons or create different artifacts of the knowledge that they want to create in a structured semantic way. Mm. And that can then also be um, adding to the reputation buildings also of articulary researchers or any researcher really. It helps um, the research assessment as we change now with mm -hmm. SFDORA and Quara. Uh, like for implementation <laughs> we've had also conversations on this um, podcast um, um, around these 
new developments and desperately needed developments to better assess research quality or for the first time quality rather than quantity. And so, yeah, so these are our ways to, to get engaged and to contribute to a better scientific and research ecosystem and making sense of all the product, the, the results that we're generating and helping societal actors to, to adopt them for implementation in whichever sector. Absolutely. <laughs> Excellent. So thank you so much for your time today. And yeah, and we'll hear more of you maybe later um, down the road as the uh, knowledge graph keeps evolving. And um, yeah, welcome back anytime. And, and listeners, please get in touch if you want to learn more. And otherwise, it's just to sign up and, and play and, and add your data and do your analysis. Yeah. Thank you very much. And it's also possible to consume data from the ORKG without signing up. So that is oh, also. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, as <laughs> <laughs> you thank you for having us, Joe. Thanks for the very nice questions. <laughs> it's my pleasure. Thanks for answering. <laughs>